Welcome to the Andy Staples Show. This is a very special edition. I have been waiting for this one for a long, long time. You may have listened before when we did a Judge Andy episode. We, we, had, we had Antonio Morales, our USC beat writer, who he and Ari occasionally get into a little verbal sparring. And Ari said, we should bring Antonio on and you can be the arbiter and decide which one of us is right. Because we're, we're so dug in on our positions that we need someone impartial to, to tell us, okay, who, who's right on this thing. And so we did. Antonio won. Ari thinks I'm not impartial. But the Roku remote of justice is here. Judge Andy's court is in session. And Ralph Russo is joining us because Ralph... The esteemed National College Football Writer for the Associated Press. One of the most dedicated listeners to this show. Not always on the day it comes out. Who's on my back far more than Antonio Morales, by the way. Definitely. Definitely. So our uh, Ralph will text Ari and I four or five days after show's air. Just fired up because he has just heard the thing. And Ari are like, what? Ari and I are like, wait, wait, what are you talking about? Wait, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, we did say that. So it is tremendous because sometimes I maybe play the straight man a little too much with Ari. Maybe I don't push back on some of his more outrageous statements. And there comes a time when maybe he needs to be held to account. So how often on the show are you thinking to yourself, this is so ridiculous? Like, honestly, how often does that occur to you in your mind and you don't push back on a daily basis on a show by show basis? I'd say there's three or four moments in each show. That I'm just like so insane that like you can't even imagine what I'm saying. You you had I was list re-listening to an old show, and you said something to the tune. You gave me a hypothetical of what it, what would be worse: never having cheese again or never having bacon again. No, I mean football related topics. I mean I under- oh. I know those are out. Well, like, one of the that ones that we're going to talk things? about today is 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 one that I always that always gets my ears perked up, and okay. I, I don't want to spoil it, but you know that you have some takes that. I just feel like you're you're extremely dug in on them, and I think maybe maybe I need to hear a little more nuance to them. Maybe I need to hear you explain them, Ralph. I I, I don't know about you. Are there things that you hear that you want to get a, a little further detail on? So I need to set this up a little bit, dear dear viewer, dear listener. I am just like you, right? I, I listen to the show. I find myself thinking like, oh, that was a really good take. The difference is really you have both of our phone numbers. Exactly. The only difference is instead of getting into the the YouTube comments or tweeting at you guys, I just have a text stream. I, I, can, just, I can just text you guys. So I'm just like you. I just have a, a, a more direct line. I, I really love Ari's work. He is, he is really good at what he does. I respect him a lot. He's already there backpedaling also, off number five, I think. No, but there are also oh, times. Oh, no, he's not. <laughs> there are also times when I find myself wondering, and I think I've literally texted this, is Ari real? Like, is this a real person I'm listening to? <laughs> there, there are moments when I actually think, like, he is a fictionally, he's a fictional character written for a sitcom. And you know how I well, know I, that, like, I feel like I'm fit for a straight jacket is that in my mind, I don't really feel like I have college football takes. Okay, you can say what you want about my food or how I feel about Disney mm-hmm. World. We're all different people. We all like different things. But I don't feel like I have college football takes that are so outrageous that it would cause you to pull your hair out. Usually not. Usually not. But I, I think as we get a little more into this, you are sort of staunchly embedded in your brand right now to the extent where like you've almost become a cult leader <laughs> I what know, Warren Jeff? Call ari's cult followers you know it's like it, 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 went, from, Maniacs? it went from the church of the church of stars matter to like the cult of stars matter and like I, I think you're only a few steps from like having like drinking drinking kool-aid like i just 
Like <laughs> sometimes I am when you text me for sure. You have, you have, it's, except it's Bud Light Lime. <laughs> Again, like I don't know how deeply we want to get into this until we start our debate here, but you you've established this really great brand amazingly enough on the most obvious take in the history wow, of no, no, this, is a, this is the finale we're okay. not going All right. to the end of that's going to be the one that i get most fired up about too ralph so just, back. We'll, we'll save but that wanna, for the I, end i, okay. I want to warm you guys up we're going to warm up we have we have five topics they're agreed upon we've already tweeted them out but i do want to warm you guys up because we're recording this on thursday night on friday george kliavkov will take the mic at pac 12 media days it has now basically been revealed to the world, especially with Kevin Warren telling our Nicole Auerbach on Wednesday night that he's going to soften his stance on the 5AQ thing, which is the one thing he and Greg Sankey had disagreed upon before. Uh, we know now that the other members of the alliance got played and got played hard. What's George Klyavkov going to say about getting played? That's a good point. Um, I, I, you know, I he's a pretty sharp guy, and he's got to come out in, a, in positioning himself as strong as possible, right? Like, because we've heard a lot of bluster out of the Big 12 because the Big 12 is looking at itself, feeling itself, right? Chest mm -hmm. out, hey, we were in their position last year. We're not getting caught in that again. We're the strong ones. We're going to do the poaching. So I don't know how he does it, but somehow uh, George K needs to position the Pac-12, show some strength out of the Pac-12, and try to come up with some way to show some unity out of the Pac-12. I, I, you know, he's a good salesman, and it's going to be a test of his his ability to be a salesman because I don't know if he's got a ton to sell right now, but he's going to have to portray strength. All right, what would you say if you're if you're George K? I mean, I agree. I actually, I we're going to we're gonna start off the show with me agreeing with Ralph. You know, I think this is a very. Uh, very interesting time in the sport and um, every single commissioner has to do everything they can to portray a strength of power um, and being in a position that he's in right now, I think it's probably the most pivotal position that a person can be in um, heading into the new world of college football. So I'll echo everything that, that Ralph said and I'll extend an olive branch before the gloves come off. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, and, and it's interesting. He's in a weird position because he's only been there a year. A lot of what he's trying to do is, deal with what he inherited which is what what larry scott left him and there's a lot to deal with you know brett yormark the new guy at the big 12 he just got here he's going to get a pass probably no matter what happens because he just got here but george is in a, in a little different position because he's one of the three people who uh what did jim phillips say they looked each other in the eyes of the alliance yeah let me, let me ask you this though Everybody loves to blame Larry Scott for everything in the Pac-12. Klyovkov had a chance last year to do some to be the aggressor mm -hmm. when the Big 12 was vulnerable Correct. Correct. and passed. So, you know, again, George has come in and been the anti-Larry. And that has alone made him, lifted him up in the eyes of fans. And everybody else says, oh, no, this guy, he knows what he's talking about. I've liked the fact that he's been a disruptor, that he looks at things because I'm not a college uh, sports guy. Like, hey, why does well, what, what has he disrupted other than blowing his chance to try to help build consensus on a thing that would have really helped his league? I don't know well, what that, if it would have kept USC and UCLA, but they blew it. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I think at a certain point, like, you know, the – he inherited a mess. Well, now it's come. It's it's to the point where some of this stuff is happening on your watch, and you need to answer for it too. So he's at he's at a, he's at a pivotal moment here, where all of a sudden, in a in a few months, he could be the guy that was on watch when the Pac-12 died. Yeah, I mean, right. I honestly can sympathize with the situation because I can't imagine taking a job of that magnitude and all this happening what months after he took that job. Yes. And like you have all yeah. these different the goals or views of the conference that you're leading um, heading into this job and, you know, messes that are perceived to be, you know, pertinent to clean up. And then all of a sudden, you know, conference expansion ex explodes and it's just like, what are you going to do? You know, and it's like I could I could put myself in that position and feel like I would have probably reacted the same way that he did because you don't want to do just, too I much too fast. Right. So, you know, I just think George I, and George and Jim Phillips should have gotten together at some point as they were trying to obstruct that 12 team plan and said, why are we doing this? This is dumb. 
this thing will help us both. And now, look, it may not have happened because you had to have a unanimous vote. And Kevin Warren may have said, nope, not doing it because he wanted to make sure ESPN didn't get another sniff or any sort of advantage at extending that thing out on its own past 2026. I get that. But now they look like they got completely worked over by the Big Ten. And they did. Yeah. And they could have tried to help their leagues, and they didn't. And that's why, like, Jack Swarbrick came out after all that fell apart and said, it doesn't make sense that people are not acting in their own best interest. And if Pac-12 dies after all this, well, not acting in your league's best interest. Is there be anything the that reason. he could have done to keep USC and UCLA in, in the saddle there? That I don't know. Ralph, I mean, they, they, were, you... they, they were talking, they, they started conversations almost when he got in the league, when he talked about, we have to emphasize football, we have to emphasize football, we have, you know, he had mentioned something about like the bigger brands, like what he would, that was code for, hey, we might need to give more money. Right. Which, by the, the way, the they did schools. until the deal, the last TV deal that Larry Scott did when it, when it became not... an equal revenue share it's not necessarily a healthy way to run a conference. And that's mm -hmm. why when you, and you've talked a little bit about this on this show, the idea of, well, maybe you give, if you're the big 12, maybe you give Oregon and Washington most favored nation status. Well, that's a good way to run a dysfunctional conference, which of course, but I don't mean give them more money. Like, that's the, yeah. But also yeah. running a dysfunctional conference is better than running one that doesn't exist anymore. So, you know, Precisely. I mean, I guess you got to, so yeah. that, that's the, the hardest part of like, if you don't think that, he could have done anything to preserve UCLA and UCLA's so. or USC and UCLA's membership. Then you can't give him too much of a hard time. Now he has a chance to save the conference. And I think that's what Ralph was saying of like, now if you're the aggressor, yeah. you know, you were dealt a bad hand. Now you're in a position to actually make some moves. Are there teams that you can, you know, get from the big 12 or other sources that can make your conference strong again or strong enough to continue to exist. And that'll be kind of one of the main bullet points of what we're watching out for as the expansion continues. That's exactly right. All right. We, we have had the undercard now. We, we've warmed everybody up. It's time I'm for the main event. What you are about to witness is real. The participants are not actors. Ari Wasserman has said something on this podcast that has caused one of his coworkers to call him a dumbass. Rather than meet in Temecula and settle it with their fists, the two parties have agreed to dismiss their claims and have their disputes settled here in our forum, Judge Andy's Court. I love that song so much. I wish I could meet you in Temecula, Ralph. I love not being in Southern California. Yeah, yeah. I was pretty jacked. Uh, but well, I, I think you'd probably rather meet at Lincoln Riley's house, but yeah, that's true. We we've got the Roku remote of justice here. It will be hammered down when we make our rulings. I think the best way to do this is because this is our you know, Ralph has brought these points up. I think I should just sort of throw it out there. We'll let Ari respond okay. and then offer the the context of of what he means and then ralph and ari can debate and so I, i'm on defense have... well uh, yeah basically okay that's good it's it's like overtime defense you okay. want to start on defense so okay all right here we go number one ari complains about playoff expansion and then calls oklahoma's 11 and 2 season a disaster ralph thinks it's exactly that attitude that makes people want to expand the playoff ari the floor is yours. You know, one of the things that I think I've done well in my career, if you think I've done anything well, Ralph, is uh, I try to put myself in a position where I want to think if I'm writing a story or talking about a program about how their fans would feel. Okay, so like to me, the idea of Oklahoma, which has ran through the Big 12 like it's no no issue for them and made the playoff basically every single year since the beginning of Lincoln Riley's tenure before he left. When you look at 11 and 2, Context matters. You know, at Oklahoma, 11 and 2 isn't the same thing as it is at Pitt or at, the, or at other schools. And I think that viewing 
um, certain programs. And I think that even in the text messages before you said, well, he thinks Ohio State sucked last year. Ohio State didn't suck as it relates to 99% of other schools. It sucked in relation to what it thinks it should be. So like when I say these types of things, maybe they come off as harsh and I take accountability for that. But Oklahoma season to an Oklahoma fan that cares deeply about that program thought that last year's season was a disaster. And part of the reason why I've been reluctant, at least in the old system, before we expand the playoff, which is inevitable, is that when teams like Oklahoma that demand excellence and view going undefeated and winning their conference as the main prize of what their program stands for, they should not play for a national title in those years. So as we continue to talk about um, – Conference expansion, my viewpoints, if you've been listening to the show, have kind of softened a little bit about the conference of the playoff expansion, because I think inclusion with other conferences that aren't a part of the big two that is inevitable um, is important for the entire sports health from coast to coast. But if you think that 11 and two is a pat on the back, good season, fellas, for Oklahoma or the other blue blue bloods that are trying to win a national title, then, you know, I think that's just like old school thinking. And I'm not a part of that. No, so Ari says he wants to speak for the fan or he wants to be the voice of yeah, but you're speaking for the worst fan, right? You're like <laughs> the, the message board fan who pulls out his hair and wants to fire everybody because they lost one or two games and is now like, you know, still thinking, well, Lincoln, glad he's gone because we were on the downturn. Like, no, I don't think you're speaking for I think you're speaking for a very small percentage of a fan base who might be. Listen, I'm how sure. do you categorize an 11 and two season for Oklahoma as a as a good fan? Good. Well, I good year? Don't categorize it as a disaster. Yeah, it's, no, I mean, I yeah, I mean, a, I can I can see what like the word I mean, disaster maybe, might not maybe be. Maybe it's a disappointment, but I mean, at what point do you not give a little leeway if you're a fan? I'm sure Oklahoma fans, especially when they were watching the Oklahoma State game, were pissed. And really disappointed because they don't lose to Oklahoma State. But I'm sure they also, well, maybe not the next day because the next day they lost their coach. But in a normal next day would have stepped back and said, you know what? We're still Oklahoma. We're still all right. Like, I I just think that you take this to the extreme where I under and listen, Ryan Day, I was just at media day, said 11 and two winning the Rose Bowl. I said. Yeah. Not good enough at Ohio State. But I think you're framing it in a different way. The coaches, of course, have to say that because they have to understand that, like, listen, we, we're, we're playing for bigger things here. But the mindset that, like, 11-2 and two is a disaster and Ohio State sucked last year is exactly why people look at the, look at the playoff and I'm like, wait a second. We got to expand this thing because if the only thing that's a success is playing for the national championship, like what fun is at those schools? And it always has been. But it doesn't. But but so. But you expand the playoff, you're just giving the good teams a second chance. But only one team can win a national championship. And if nothing but a national championship is a failure, like I can understand if I'm an Alabama fan kind of feeling that way. But if that's where you are as a fan, you're out of your mind. Like you're you you've set unreasonable expectations to the playing point, for the to the point where you won't enjoy the sport anymore. If your expectations are if we don't play for a national championship, our season was a disaster. How can you enjoy this thing? <laughs> like, how can you possibly have fun being a fan if you if your only expectation is my joy will only come if we play for the national championship? I just think you're speaking for a section of the fan base. That is put yourself in an Oklahoma's fan situation going into the season last year. They had the Heisman Trophy winning quarterback. If you would have done a random poll of an Oklahoma fan and said, what does a two loss season amount to in your mind um, at the end of the year um, and not playing for your conference championship and not being the Big 12 champ? How do you think people would categorize that as okay after what after the season that they came into? Of course, I'm not saying they're, they're okay with it. But again, there's a big there's a huge gap. There's an ocean between I'm okay with with having an 11 and two season, 
where we were supposed to play for a national championship, and it was a disaster. So we're having a semantics argument about what word I happened to but, use in that moment? But that's a big difference. Well, again, though, that's not semantics. Semantics is it was an okay season. It was a disappointing season. Okay, what level of disappointment? But you always throw, sort of throw out those those hyperbolic words of it was a disaster. Ohio State sucked last year. Ohio like, State sucked last year. <laughs> so I was like, there you go. <laughs> They stop. All right, all right. Ding, okay, ding, yeah. ding, 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 ding. I put uh, retu- my entire retu- life of ten, of ten years of covering that team. That team stunk. But okay, th- this is the other thing. Okay. I do all think, right. and, and you are not a homer. I've never, I will never accuse you of being a homer. But I think ten years in Columbus made some of the worst of that seep into your brain. That now you sort of have like taken on the most irrational part of the fan base. And I you've think it's taken possible. that into your personality. I think, I really I think one of my biggest flaws as I a think person ten years in this at position, Ohio State did that. Ten me. years at Ohio State has made me bit uh, made me view the success that that team had as normal. And I think at times I have been uh, unreasonably harsh towards teams that shouldn't be held to the same standard. Okay. So if that's your point, I can totally own up to that. And I'm trying to rejigger my brain into thinking like, hey. But, like, I also hold Oklahoma in the, in the team that we were talking about to a similar standard. So, you know, I'll let – conceded mm-hmm. the point, Andy, make a ruling. All right. <laughs> I grew up in SEC country. If you ain't first, you're last. <sighs> Expectations slide based on success, relative performance, recent performance, and format of postseason, of season – they're going to slide no matter what. And so Oklahoma fans' expectations of success are not going to change. They're going to expect Oklahoma to occupy a certain space in the college football universe. They didn't last year. Ohio State was not what they were supposed to be. It's not a matter of did you have what objectively most people would consider a good season. It's a matter of did you have what you consider to be a good season. Ari is the victor. I didn't lose. Well, there's four more questions. I just, so I mean, I, I'm going to get, get cocky. on the rest of the way because I thought Ralph argued, argued his point very well on that one. Um, I thought both of you argued your points very well. I, I think was, that's that the was, entire literal point of podcasting. So One of um, the best conversations we've ever had on this show. Okay. Next, I can't next wait point. for the next four. Next one. Ralph is minus 400 on this one, by the way. <laughs> Ari <laughs> thinks Penn State should just start Drew Aller right now, even if it means winning fewer games this season. Bigger picture, not just Penn State. Ari almost always believes that a team should start the five-star QB over whoever the other guy is. Ari always almost thinks the five-star future of the program should start over the current quarterback if the current quarterback isn't immeasurably better than he is at that point, which wasn't mentioned in that thing. And I thought that's one of the things that I took exception to. So do I think that Drew Aller blindly should just be starting over Sean Clifford right now? No, I don't think that. If Sean Clifford is uh, four, five, six wins better than Drew Aller is right now, then you play the, the older guy, you develop the young guy, and he takes over in the future. My point has always been that if you know what you're going to be with Sean Clifford, which is what, Ralph, a three-loss team probably, that if Drew Aller comes in and plays – similarly and they end up losing four or five games as a result of it and then have a better version of that player for the following year that there's not a huge disparity in my mind between going nine and three or eight and four or seven and five when a three loss season isn't something that that program is going to even like care about at that point so if it's uh um not playing in the who gives a crap bowl instead of playing in the spaghettios bowl like does anybody really care about that And like, to me, I would much rather position myself as a program that's going to come in with a very talented, maybe raw player as a freshman who's going to come into a sophomore season and be far more ready to compete at a high level and get your team to uh, a conference championship game than you would be if if you just start the guy that you know who he is because he's older. Okay, so you qualified your point there in a way when you were making that point back on the original podcast, you failed to do, which is because you were sort of all in when you made that point originally that no, just start Aller, just start out, just play the kid. No, if he stinks, then or he's not ready yet, or he's not developed, or he needs to put a year in the weight room, then I understand. If you thought that I just think blindly throw in the freshman no matter what, and I communicated that on the podcast, and I did a poor job on that previous show. 
but nonetheless, though, I mean, I think you're also so. Let me steer it away from that. No, because you're the one that thinks that two wins are important, even if it's if it's three losses instead of four or five. No, that's and, and that's what, and that's what I will get to. Okay. Like, I, I think that you got to max out every season. You just talked about think about what you just argued before about Oklahoma having a disaster at eleven and two, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're if you're Penn State and you're rolling into a season and thinking like. I can go nine and three with this guy, or I can go seven and five with that guy. With Are the potential just... of going nine to th- nine and three, if they're measurably close, then sure. You know, if you can't what? play the older guy to avoid maybe losing another game or two. Uh, my feeling is you play the best guy, right? You play the best guy, like, and, and I think that you're you're leaving some gray area. Well, it's kind of close, so we're just gonna play the young guy. And maybe he's not the best guy, but it will be beneficial in the long run. And what I'm saying is you always got to play for that season. You always have to play to max out that season. So the ultimate question becomes, who will get me more wins this season? And you're saying, if if in doubt, go with the kid. And I say, don't be in doubt. Figure out which one will play better. Yes, if it's a tie and you want to go with the kid. But you're leaving room here to say. What if like, the Madden rating of the older guy is 83 and the Madden rating of the freshman is 79? I will just say this: you have to max out this season. You cannot play to develop your five stars when you're playing at that level. Whatever you think is best and will get you the most wins, you cannot enter your season thinking like, yeah, nine and three, seven and five, not a big deal. That's not the way it works around here. You know why? Your fans don't want to hear that. Your fans will know the difference between nine and three and seven and five. They will damn well know the difference between nine and three and seven and five. Because you know what? Last year at Penn State, they very well could have been nine and three. And do you think people at Penn State, Happy Valley, those Nittany Lion fans would have been having a conniption over giving Franklin a 10 year extension if they were nine and three instead of, oh, we, you know, we, we lose Clifford at halftime in the Iowa game. That game gets pissed away. Um, and we can't score because he's hurt the next week for three hours at the one yard line against Illinois. Like those couple of w- in college football, one or two wins is completely reshapes your season, which sets the tone for your recruiting, which sets the momentum for the next year. You just said an 11 and two season for Oklahoma was a disaster. You're not giving up nine and three for seven and five. You play the best players. Okay. I've been waiting to retort now. Okay. Cause okay. nine and three and seven and five are both forgettable seasons and forgettable seasons are forgettable seasons. So let me ask you this. Do you invest? This is a really important question because it was a big day today. I do not. Okay. Amazon is one of the biggest, most powerful companies in America. And what Amazon does is it makes billions of dollars a quarter. And instead of pulling the lever and just taking all that money for profit, they reinvest back into the company as they continue to grow to become a bigger conglomerate later on down the line, which I think is genius. If you are the CEO of a, college football program you don't look at wins for that given season as the only thing if you say over a four-year period we might lose two or three more in year one but win five or six more in the next three years combined as a result of that experience then you look your 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 corporate your your team as a corporation and you figure out hey you know what we might give a little in the beginning the way that Amazon does with their finances only to invest in the, in the future so that you have a more um, lucrative solution three or four years down the line, like caring about the two or three wins in a, in a one game season is like getting pissed off over the ticker because it's down a dollar one day when those little ticks up and down the thing make no difference. So like, to me, it's like comparing Penn state's nine and three season to Oklahoma's 11 and two, it doesn't really make much difference because they both failed. If you fail to meet expectations, you're just in the failed to meet expectations ratio. And like, I get what you're saying about recruiting and and morale and, and temperament from the fans and how important it is to max it out. Um, But I also feel like investing into your program and being smart about it, especially in the age of the transfer portal 
where you don't want to even piss off your five-star quarterback even for a second because they can bail at any given moment. You have to consider the great, the 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 good of your program, not just for the extra win and a forgettable season anyway, but for the the longevity of the of the talent that you're trying to to manifest and the in the direction that you want your program to go to. Especially if you're a coach that's got a ten-year, hundred million dollar contract. Of ding, course, ding, ding, ding. Of course all right, all right, gentlemen, right. gentlemen, two corners, two corners. Okay, I think I've heard enough. Ari, you play to win the games. And a 9-3 and three season at Penn State would probably feel a lot different than a 7-5 and five season at Penn State this year, especially with the schedule. I think there's more nuance to this than, than you're thinking, even though you, are, you have added some nuance to it. But not every decision is as easy as Trevor Lawrence versus Kelly Bryant. Sometimes you've got to worry about, if I throw this five-star in, am I going to break him? You know, it, it, you, there's, there's more to it. Than that, and if that's and also, part of the consideration, then you don't do it. Five star wants to transfer because he didn't immediately win the starting job. He's probably not the QB you wanted anyway. I am ruling for Ralph Russo here. The Roku remote of justice has spoken. Well done, Ralph. Good point. I personally yeah. cannot wait for next year when Arch Manning and Quinn Ewers are in the same quarterback room at Texas. And Ari's head explodes. It is <laughs> well, five star be... versus five stars is the Ari Wasserman and Nirvana, but um... it, it is going to be tremendous. All right. Number three. Ari will only take his daughter to Disney World <laughs> if he gets the super expensive, expensive front of line concierge service, which after that episode, the listeners were good, very good to us explaining exactly how much that costs. It's very expensive. Yeah. Well, the one thing I want to say is the concierge service that you pitched to me, because I've got no experience with Disney World, other than I know that it's really, really hot there and you've got to wait in line six hours if you don't do it. But there is a middle tier between concierge service that's 25 grand and express pass that gets you to the front of the line or that you, you wait 25 minutes instead of four hours. So the only point that I'll ever make about Disney World is, is that, of course, I'm going to take my daughter there. I love her very much. She's going to want to go. We're going to go. But when and if we do go, I'm not going to be standing in line for six hours for a ride because I feel like if I'm paying five, ten thousand bucks to be there for a week, I don't want to blow half my day standing in line in, in the heat, sweating my ass off to, to go on four rides in a given day. Makes no sense. I'm, I'm definitely going to buy the premium pass. OK, so again, you a Disney World snob, Ralph? With, no, with a little more nuance, you have provided a, a place where I see a little more common ground. And but do you think that the points that he put on Twitter with the written out is my entire existence? Of course, there's more nuance. You know, sometimes you, know, you like nuance. luxury, no, Ari. You do a good job of hiding your nuance, I, <laughs> yeah. Ari. Like your nuance when you get challenged, but you're all about the bluster uh, initially in the hype and the hyperbole uh, at, at first. But you get nuance when you get challenged. I agree with you. One of the things I tell people about Disney, this is one place I agree with you. One of the things I, I tell novices like you about Disney is don't worry about the money. If you can, I win. If you can, <laughs> if you can, try not to worry about the money. Like it's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt like hell when you plunk down the money for certain things. But try not to worry about the money. But I also think you're you're again like your your um, your naivete about Disney and the idea that like there is even a world in which you don't stand on lines, right? Like that's. That, Unless you're unless you're making, you know, I don't know what you're making from the athletic, but unless it's Stu Mandel money, you're standing on lines, right? Like there's or there's no, there's, no, there's no way there's no way around this. Well, by the time my daughter is old enough to go, I hope I will be making Stu Mandel money. Yeah, I mean, well, if people buy my dumbass shtick that you say I, I have. Hope, hopefully, I did not call it dumbass. <laughs> I might, but I might eventually. Um, <laughs> All I'm saying is, like, listen, the lines are part of the experience. You're going to do what's best for your daughter. You're going to pay what's be what as much as you can to make your daughter happy. But, again, it's this sort of – Which involves this, buying the pass. That's it. Right. But how over. much of it but, – But, right. So, okay. So, okay, you're dialing it back a little bit. You were talking about, like, the most extravagant But when we had that and show, in fairness to me, I didn't know that exists. That middle tier existed. He said Butler – If the, if the decision was Butler only – and not going at all, then I'll still I'll stand by my point and say I'll just I'm going to go with the Butler pass. <laughs> ding 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 ding! I've heard enough. I'm not going to stand in line for eight hours a day if I'm spending ten thousand dollars a week to be there. It makes no sense. I, I say this as someone who has owned annual passes to various Orlando theme parks. 
Waiting in line and paying to wait in line sucks. Waiting in line in the heat, paying to wait in line in the heat sucks. If there's any way you can afford to not do that, God bless you. Also, it's your vacation. It should be what's fun to you. Some people go on vacations that to me sound terrible. Like, I don't want to go camping. That sounds like work. I'm not doing that. So whatever, I don't want to go but, but you either. may, you may think that is the greatest experience in the world. And I'm, I respect that. So Ari, I will rule in favor of you. You but are I don't correct even, I, on this After one. we, after we have that point though, I still don't even know what Ralph disagrees with. No. And I think again, you provide some nuance on the back end and you sort of cut me, uh, cut out my legs a little bit and arguing against you because the, the initial eye rolling comment about, I need to have the 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 premier service to get my ass to Disney or I'm not going for my daughter is an absurd comment. Ari, so Ari likes his luxury that though. That, that is that is Ari, that is who Ari is. And I am I am okay with it. If that is who you are on vacation, if that is what you want out of your vacations, that's fine. Some Especially people like like I feel like to, I'm just picturing my six year old daughter if that's how old she is when we go just standing in the heat like that just like, I want her to have the best possible time. I, I don't want to go to Disney World at all, to be honest. I have no interest of ever Well, okay. Th this, of course, brings up the fact that uh, Ari has the soul of a, of a 75-year-old man who has already retired to Boca, right? Exactly. I, oh, yeah. Is, I mean, really, that is your spirit animal, right? Yeah. Right. Shirt off, white chest hair. It's yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah. Is there a medallion? Yeah, big in Jewish the chest star hair. right here. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know the type. I don't got to spell it go. out to you. Grew up in Philly, moved down there. I got it. Yeah, that's oh, me. I just I I can't figure out if Ari's a Boca retiree or if he's a uh, a Naples retiree. I think I, I it's that's a totally different vibe. So I'm not sure. My not time sure I spent one. in Boca. My best friend's father actually retired and lives in Boca, and he has the perfect life. <laughs> like that's what I want to retire with. So. Ari is actually winning two to one. We move on to number four. How do you feel about that, Ralph? I'm I'm not I'm not shocked that you've got an early lead here. I'm not shocked. Yeah. Number okay. four. There's gonna be more nuance coming too. Ari considers Domino's cheesy bread to be America's best appetizer. You know what? I'm gonna not I'm gonna give Ralph the benefit of the doubt here. No extra nuance. I think it's the most delicious appetizer that I could have at any restaurant. And if you cut that appetizer up and put it on the table at Mastro Steakhouse and you didn't know it was from Domino's, you would think it's the most delicious thing that you ever ate. And people roll their eyes because it's from Domino's and they won't accept the fact that they're just like, oh, it's fast food. It's gross. It's disgusting. It's bad for you. I know it's delicious. And I don't think I've had an appetizer anywhere at any restaurant that I would rather eat than cheesy bread from Domino's. It's my favorite one. And I'm sorry, I don't like exactly what you like. like no, but, but it's an entryway to just a, a broader topic here. The fact that you would choose, like, because I've heard you talk about the idea that you would choose Domino's. Like, there are times when you would have the opportunity to go to a, a, a neighborhood pizzeria and get real pizza, and you would choose the mass production pizza. Like, like I, I've, I've hit. Sometimes it hits. Ralph is offended no, as a not, Brooklyn resident. It never resident. hits. It and never I don't live hits. in New York. So what no, do you think? I've got some sort of beautiful, amazing pie down the street in Dallas. Are you living? Like, you live in like the fourth largest in metro area in, in, in America. No, I know, but the pizza is not like it is where it's not convenient like it will be for Ralph to just drive a mile away from his house and get a really authentic, great slice. Drive of a York. mile, walk around the block, dude. Yeah, I don't know where you live. If do you live in Manhattan, <laughs> I live in Brooklyn. Okay, so yeah, just walk around for thirty seconds and get one of the best pieces of pizza on the face of the I, earth. I don't you have that cannot tell you live in Dallas. You don't live in like you know some Bird Villeville. There like, is, have, there is other options in Dallas that has better pizza than Domino's for sure. Yeah. But I can pull out my cell phone and order Domino's and have it at my house in 27 minutes without ever like breaking a sweat. Sometimes when you're in a mood to smash pizza, you don't want to get in the car and go find some place, get out of it in the heat, pay for it, get Again, in the car and drive you home. Live? You, you, you live in one of the major American cities. I am so confident that you can have a pizza delivered from a pizzeria almost any time of the day, Ari. And they don't have like, Domino's cheesy bread. Like, what do you want from me? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> 
I, I would take Domino's cheesy. cheesy bread over any appetizer that you could find at any pizzeria on the face of the earth. Because I have, and I'm not saying it's the best ever, because I haven't had every single appetizer on the face of the earth. Okay. But it's it to me, it's delicious. And sometimes I just want to eat that. I, I hate I hate to be the guy who's like, no, you like something that you shouldn't like. Because you're right, we all like our things. We all have, but it's just, and Domino's it's, is pretty good. No, it's not. It's it's really not. It's the best of the worst. Which is basically all of those, like those, all the teams that you want in the playoff, exactly. Yeah, like that. <laughs> the best of the worst. Yeah. Domino's is the 12 that could beat the yeah. five. And sometimes the 12 can beat the five in my book. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> all right. I've heard enough. I've heard enough. Ding, 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 ding. And he gets Domino's too. So whatever he says, I, now, I don't care. He, he gets Domino's. I say this as someone who only, actually loves. Only in press boxes after the game will I eat Domino's. When it's served to me, you I will never live choose in the Domino's. best city for pizza on the face of the planet. There's a New York a, style pizzeria city, Ari, everywhere, there, Ari. Yeah, Not in Ohio. City, Ari. Not when I lived in Columbus. Pizza. There wasn't a there's, single triangle slice. Get Bill Landis we on. We are phone everywhere. Here. There's a New Yorker every how, place in the country. There's a business opportunity in Columbus. Dare you blaspheme the Sonatos, yes. Ari. It does not <laughs> exist in Columbus. Next time you're there, go do me a favor. Next time you cover a game at Ohio State, Ralph, get a New York slice. And send me a picture of the Columbus restaurant you got it at. I, I'll pay you 100 bucks. See, I, I, I live in a much smaller town than either of you. There's actually better pizza closer to my house than Domino's. So, do they have better cheesy bread? Uh, no, Domino's okay. has better cheesy bread than they. And do. then, if I but, read the question out loud here, it says Ari will. Oh, sorry, four considers Domino's cheesy bread to be the best appetizer on the planet. And so I will rule. You are wrong. It is not the best appetizer on the planet. Is Outback cheese fries, which must be eaten on site because they don't travel. I mean, that's a fair point too. I didn't even get into the the direct point of the of the argument that like that's the best. This this like take yes for an answer, bro. You won. You won. You don't gotta kick me in the nuts now that I'm down. You won. <laughs> <laughs> two two. We're going Rubber to the final match. Here. This is it. This is the question that will decide the winner. The most and offensive I, thing I've ever read in my entire life. It by is. The way. It, yeah. it really is. This is. We're, we're getting to the heart of the matter here. This is this is that this is the Ari's existential Ari Ari question. Which is yeah. amazing, knowing how many other people think much less of you than I do. That some that, uh, this is the most impressive. That's a very offensive thing. thing when you read this point out loud. Ralph <laughs> thinks Ari's entire mission statement, "Stars Matter," is essentially "Water is wet," and can't believe Ari has built a brand or brand career on that. I'm not. Well, how am I supposed to even respond to this? That was in our text. You, well, now you have to respond if you'd like Andy, to win do you this. think that people think that recruiting stars is water is wet? The well, way that people I, react to that thought? I want to hear you guys argue about this. I, I, I need think to that hear I have your... done a good job of making Stars Matter the funny brand that um, we all kind of joke about now because essentially, yes, that is a very, very obvious point that everybody knows if you have more good players you have a better team you have a better chance of winning although there are plenty of people in my comments every single day refuting that argument somehow it is a very obvious statement and i agree with you i think my brand has been built off of writing about recruiting and adding nuance to it in a way that you can't find everywhere else and i think people enjoy reading about it other than visits commitments i um you know, announcement dates and top fives and all this stuff. I, I don't do that. I write about what things mean, trends, numbers, the importance of recruiting as it pertains to the direction of a program, what it means for coaches. And I think part of the reason why we're on this podcast so much talking about that is because it is the main point of, of where it's like the NFL draft for college. So it's like, you know, making fun of an NFL draft person for talking about uh, prospects. And the thing I, that is so funny to me, Ralph, is that if it's so obvious, how often does the AP write recruiting features? Do they do it? So, 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 that's a good, that's a very good. It's point. so obvious. Wow. It's all out there everywhere. No one does wow. it. Wow. Not that often because we don't, we don't delve too that much into recruiting. Into the but most here, important thing that determines whether and a team is good I, or and not. here's what I'll tell you. And here's what I will say, uh, Ari. I think your recruiting coverage is tremendous, right? So that that's separate from my take here. That's separate from my my. Well, my, my it's all part of my brand. It's who I am. My brand right. is me. <laughs> 
but the, for, okay, but again, That's a t-shirt right there. It's what leads you to extremism here because you've created this brand on water is wet. The best players create the best teams. God bless you for being able to again turn this into a thing that like you discovered that water is wet and the best players create the best teams and you have created this brand. And by the way, you do a great job of covering recruiting, but it leads you to this, to the extremism, which we talked about before. Oh no, we got to play the five star. We got to play the five star because it's all about development and five star, five star, five star. I just, it's about stars, 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 Mm -hmm. stars, stars. And to the point where we're not really talking about wins and losses anymore. To the point where where everything revolves around a handful of teams that recruit all the five stars. And everything that's not that isn't really important. It's all about the handful of teams that recruit five stars. So you're, you you built this church. And but it the has handful really, of teams that recruit the best also happen to have the largest fan bases and the most people that consume our podcast. No, that's fine. And that's fine. Yeah, I, I mean, like that's part of the reason that. of it. I understand people are like, well, why don't you cover yes. Iowa State more? I don't know, because there's for every one Iowa State fan that's listening and reading our story, Stories, there's a 50 Alabama fans like we're serving our audience base. I, I, I totally get that. I totally get that. But but constantly throwing that out there is also why people hate you. Right. Yeah. Constantly telling me my program is irrelevant because I don't get all these five stars is sort of like, again, you're sort of. But I don't know if I've ever said it that way. I but mean, you're trending into this area of, again, like I kind of love all of college football and I want to sort of appreciate all of college football. And when you do nothing but boiling it down to who's got the most stars, that's the ones that we really have to pay attention to. And everybody else, don't really worry about them because they don't really matter. But like, I just wrote a thousand word feature on Duke recruiting like two days ago. I don't I don't ignore it. OK, I, listen, again, I, I think you took this as me sort of poking fun at you because of, again, building again, I am in some ways impressed because the fact that you have built this church and built this successful career on the most obvious statement of all time is impressive. So I have to concede to you that a, you do a good job and B you manage to play off the fact that there are a lot of idiots who follow college football who somehow don't think having the best players means a lot. Like, so I get the fact. I'm that, just like, as confused as you are that it's even a debate anymore. It's not ding, a debate. Ding, 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 ding. All right. I have heard all I need to hear. And this, I, I am going to rule on this now. I'm getting, and I'm, I, getting, I, I, I'm not I feeling am, good. I'm not, I feeling am good. going to rule in favor of Ari Wasserman. Yeah. I had a feeling. And I will tell you why. I will tell you why. Only because this is college football. Because anywhere else, if you make the same argument that is essentially water is wet, Ralph's right on this, people will be like, yeah, water is wet. In college football, people will defend to the death the idea that water is dry. Like, they will not let it go. They will never agree with you. They will think you are changing the numbers, that you are moving the goalposts. Like, it is amazing to me. Like, for example, on Thursday, I was I was arguing with some people who don't want the playoff to expand. And, and there's a guy who kept, you know, coming back and coming back. And it's clear he doesn't want it to expand. And he's very dug in. And it's like, he, it, he just doesn't see the world like a normal person would. Like... He tweets out a screenshot of the 2018 final CFP rankings and says, think about this as a playoffs. And he think he thinks people will look at it and go, Oh God, I wouldn't <laughs> want to see bad. that. Right. <laughs> well, that's bad. Number one, Alabama, number two, Clemson, number three, Notre Dame, number four, Georgia, number five, Oklahoma, number six, Ohio state, number seven, Michigan, number eight, UCF, number nine, Florida, number 10, LSU, number 11, Washington, number 12, Penn state. That sounds like the most amazing thing you could ever watch. Yet he thinks it's a bad thing. That's, these are the people we're dealing with. You call them idiots, Ralph. I don't necessarily think they're idiots. Yeah, that's harsh. harsh. They're passionate I'll, I'll dial people. That back. If you don't think that talent equates to being good, you're an idiot. (laughs) They are passionate people who cannot admit to themselves that water is wet. And so Ari isn't built. He's built a brand on this because people keep challenging him on it. Yeah, it's like funny to me. You know how I feel sometimes, Ralph, and I'll be honest. And, you know, there's some some other people that 
recover recruiting very well, but I feel like the way that I recover recruiting is like, I'm the only person who covers the NFL draft. You know what I mean? Like sometimes yeah. I kind of get that feeling and like, that sounds funny because there's a million recruiting reporters who do the analyzing and the evaluations and they're all very good at their job. And I could never go to a, a field with 500 kids uh, running around and be like, well, this guy's the best. This guy's the second. Like those people have a true gift that I can't match. He's a knee bender, not a waist bender. I can't. I don't know how people. I honestly don't know how people rank these guys. To me, it's like it's like staring off into the abyss. But what I do think I do that very rarely other people do is take all the information that's out there and try to contextualize the game with that information. Like there is a weird disconnect between the way people cover the sport and how much they ignore the thing that is like a roadmap of who's going to be good. And that, to me, I think is a very important thing. And at times, I get overboard and say, well, maybe the five-star kid should play over the guy who is is mediocre or kind of good. Then, okay, I can accept that. Because, of course, there's a third-year junior somewhere who might not be as athletic and talented as the new stud that's coming in that might be a more effective player at that position that probably should play before the five-star defensive end or whatever it is. I get that. But there's this a weird absence of recruiting coverage and a lot of publications, and I find it to be crazy. So I think part of the reason why my brand has been built is because I'm like feel like I'm screaming out into the abyss about things that everybody should be talking about and don't. No, and it's a good point. And when we do write about recruiting here at the AP, it, it is more looking for trends and bigger picture things that aren't necessarily right. just like, hey, who's got the best class? I, when, when we get into that and we try to get into that a little more and, you know, I kind of do a little bit of everything. It tries to be on those things. So I do. Listen, I, I like to I like to mess around with the Ari because you are a, a freak of a human being, but you yeah. do a really good <laughs> job at your job. And I love the way you cover recruiting and it's fun to make fun of the fact that you built a brand on water is wet because it is remarkable that you have to fight these wars. But I would also, the one thing I would push back a little bit is, and you know this, but I, sometimes I think you lose track of this because you you are so concentrated on the teams at the top of the food chain when it comes to recruiting Mm -hmm. as, as you go farther down the ladder, it becomes a lot more blurry, right? It does. And that's that's why, right. And that's why Iowa is really good and and often kicks Sp- ass. Spoken schools, like a man who has better. put together a lot of AP polls where the difference between team number 11 and team number 31 are. No, I'm with good. you. No, I, yeah. I know that. No, they're, yeah. they're and it's yeah. the same. And it's funny, Ralph, because as you go down the recruiting rankings and you get out of the top 100 from the players, 300 to 700, oh, it's yeah. very blurry too. So there's a, there's a very big, uh correlation between those two things but yes i'm with you on that yeah guys this has been amazing i really didn't think our was gonna win <laughs> but <laughs> i, I, I listen, i'm in shock you defended yourself very well i yeah. i think even ralph will admit that uh i i was very impressed but that was so much fun thank you ralph for for always listening and for for letting us know thank you to everybody who joined us on the youtube uh, and let me thank Ralph too. I love debating stuff with you, and I think you're a brilliant mind. You do a great job covering thanks, the sport. Sorry. I'm not being I'm not being funny. Like the way that you argue points is very very good. And um, when I was on your show and you kicked my ass with the uh, with the college football expansion debate, I'm happy that I could win one on my own. But like being on with you on these shows is always a joy, and I'm I'm really thankful that you came on. Thanks. This, sorry. this was outstanding. Nice. And and Ralph, you you're welcome anytime. You know, and, and the next time he says something that ticks you off, just this isn't the away. last time we're doing this. <laughs> oh no. Doubt no. <laughs> this has been maybe my favorite episode. So uh we're we're gonna have a little more of this. But thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Great week, lot going on. You got Pac 12 Media Days on Friday. We will see what happens. We are we're headed toward the deadline of the 30 day negotiating window between the Pac-12 and its TV partners because they wanted to get that thing rolling. Some stuff may happen here in the next week or so. It's all going to be interesting. Ralph Russo will be a very busy guy. So will Ari and I. We'll talk to you on Monday.